All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the EOL seminar series. Our speaker is no stranger to EOL. I'm pleased to welcome in person Dr. Jakob Mann, who is a professor at the Technical University of Denmark in the Department of Wind Energy, Meteorology, and Remote Sensing. Jakob is an EOL affiliate scientist, currently co collaborating with Dr. Steve Onkley at EOL's in situ sensing facility and Dr. Scott Spuler at the remote sensing facility. Dr. Mann holds degrees from his native Denmark at the Aarhus and Aalborg universities in uh, mathematics, physics, and astrophysics. Dr. Mann is a well-regarded scientist in the field of wind energy and has received numerous awards in recognition of his contributions to wind energy research. In 2020, he was on Stanford University's list of the world's top 2% of scientists. Currently, Jakob is a chief editor of the Wind Energy Science Journal, which he co-founded. He is head of the Meteorology and Remote Sensing section at the Technical University of Denmark, and he is on the advisory board of AWAKEN, an American DOE project on wind farm wakes headed by the National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL. Dr. Mann's seminar title is the, is the Balconies Experiment, I have that written here, thank God, is the Balconies Experiment Studying Large-Scale Atmospheric Structures with Dual Doppler LIDARs, a highly relevant topic. For those watching virtually, we are using Slido, which you can ask questions at any time during the seminar. You can type that. Uh, the window is located at the bottom of the presentation screen. Dr. Jakob Mann, we welcome you to NCAR and EOL, and the podium is now yours. Thank you very much. Jackie. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, So this is not the first time I'm standing here. Actually, the first time I was standing here was 30 years ago in 92, and I can see some familiar faces in the audience from that time. So, so that's, uh, that's great. And what I'm talking about now actually has a little bit to do with what I talked about then. I, I, don't, I, I suppose you all remember what I was talking about then. <laughs> uh, so, um, so I'm going to talk about starting large scale uh, atmospheric structures with dual Doppler lighters. And uh, the outline of the talk is that First, I'll talk about the experiment, a little bit about the data processing, which is quite complicated, and then some study cases, and then uh, turn into more general about the spatial structure and two-point statistics uh, of, of uh, the flow that we observe, and then end up with some conclusions. So, um, so what, why do we want to study these large-scale structures? So first of all, uh, larger structures than, say, the rotor of a wind turbine have an effect on how wakes meander. So it's basically the direction of the wind in front of the turbine makes the direction of the wake, and then that will change with time. And uh, currently, the industry standard in uh, calculating meandering wakes is uh, something called dynamic wake meandering uh, model. And that uh, assumes essentially this turbulence model I was talking about 30 years ago. And that was made for describing the turbulence within the rotor uh, area of a, a turbine, the correlations within that uh, uh, space. But then it was kind of expanded. Why, why, I mean, it can produce a turbulence field uh, why don't we expand it to an en entire wind farm and then see what it does to the wake? But it was never tested for, for that purpose, and there's many reasons why it shouldn't just work. So, so we set out to kind of study these larger scale structures uh, for, for wind energy. It's also important for wind farm control. In wind farm control, you would steer, I mean, if you yaw the turbine, so turn it a little bit, then you can actually turn the wake. 
So if you know the wind direction, you know where the downwind turbines are, you can steer the wake so it doesn't hit the downwind uh, turbine. That's the theory at least. You can also derate the front turbines, so let more air go through, so to say, and then, then the downstream turbines will produce more uh, if the wake hits them. Uh, but if you don't know the wind direction and, and the, the wake changes position, then you can risk uh, producing less energy. Uh, so for, for wind farm control, we also need to know something about this large scale uh, structure. And my own model was valid for neutral shear dominated uh, turbulence, and, but these larger scale structures, they are very sensitive to stability and they are more important, say, the higher you go and the taller the turbines are. So now, just to give you some scales, um, here's the, the year, here's the size of the turbines. We are around here, early 2020s, so turbines are maybe now up to 250 meters, uh, and at our test station at Østerild, um, we uh, have capacity to, to have turbines up to 250 meters, and soon we are going to extend the capacity up to 330 meters uh, to accommodate for, for the larger uh, future uh, turbines. So that's the range of, of heights we're interested in, up to 300 meters now, basically. So the, the Østerlid uh, test center is here in Jutland, so this is Denmark, um, part of it at least, this is Norway, and this is Sweden. This is the island where DTU has the main campus, Sealand, and with the Copenhagen. And this is Jutland. Uh, and uh, up here we have the test station. We also have an older test station here with, with uh, turbines up to 160 meters. And soon we are going to have a yet a test station for even larger turbines. So here's a zoom in. So it's a pretty flat terrain. And on, on uh, this line we have six test stands where wind turbine manufacturers come and test their prototypes uh, under controlled conditions. And at, at the end of this row of turbines, we have two 250 meter uh, tall meteorological mass. And on these mass, we, uh, have been, we then mounted uh, uh, scanning lighters, uh, scanning out in these patterns. So 90 degrees scan pattern uh, overlapping and when the wind was from the west, we scanned this area. When it was from the east, we scanned this area. Um, okay, so this is a picture of the, the test station. It's pretty low forest and, and some agricultural areas. Here you see all seven stands, and these are really uh, uh, monsters. And it's fun to walk down here uh, because you can hear if it's an onshore and, or an offshore turbine. The onshore turbines, they, they don't make a lot of noise, but the offshore turbines, they are really uh, making a lot of noise. That's because the tip velocity is a little bit higher, maybe 80, 90 meters per second, and, and uh, that improves the efficiency, but it also generates a lot of, of uh, acoustic uh, noise that you couldn't have on land. But, but we test offshore wind turbines here as well as uh, onshore turbines. Okay, so, um, so we uh, had these relatively old uh, Leosphere 200S uh, scanning lighters where we uh, co-developed the scanning system with Leosphere. Uh, and then we uh, hoisted them up in the mast where we have built a balcony here for, for, for the instrument. And then uh, when it was set up, then the technician took the elevator up and, and and mounted it there. Then we did some test about, well, did we point it in the right direction? We moved a little bit down to get ground return and, and correlated that with the knowledge of the terrain. Um, so, oh, it was already in 2016 we did this. So we had these two lighters uh, and we had two phases, one where we had the balconies at 50 meters and one where they were up at 200 meters. Um, their maximum range was seven kilometers. Their range resolution was uh, 35 meters. Uh, they make this 90 degree scan in 45 seconds, so two, two degrees per second. 
uh, and swept like almost 50 kilometers. So, so this uh, colored area is the area uh, in which the angle between the beams is more than 30 degrees so that you can uh, reliably get the two horizontal components of, of, the, uh, of the flow. Um, yeah, so uh, the accumulation time for, for each measurement was one second. So you had 45 kind of measurements over a scan. So, but that also means that the resolution was uh, deteriorating as you went away from the LIDAR, not the longitudinal uh, uh, resolution, but the transversal resolution because the LIDAR was scanning kind of continuously. And so both LIDARs were scanning 90 degrees slowly and then rapidly going back and then scanning again. So uh, it was actually only here in the middle that they measured at the same air parcel at the same time. At the other positions, they might have differences in of tens of seconds, but uh, it doesn't matter that much because we are interested in the larger scales, not the small scales. So talking about the terrain, uh, here you see the height contours, and it looks like they're mountains. But then look at this scale here. It goes up to 36 meters, so it's really not much of terrain, it's pretty flat. But of course, you have the coast out here. But the distance due west to the coast is maybe 10 kilometers, ah, 20 kilometers. And yeah, so here are the two lighters. But uh, the terrain being relatively flat, the, the roughness is, is not so homogeneous. You had patches of, of forest and, and uh, agricultural land in some, in some mix. So, so here, the height of the trees is typically only like 10 meters, so it's pretty low forest. Um, but we could see the inhomogeneities in the terrain when we looked at, at 50 meters above terrain, uh, not, not so much at, at 200 meters. So this is, we had these two phases with 50 and 200 meters, lots of westerly winds, also some easterly winds in the first phase. Uh, the both phases, they covered some distribution in uh, stability. Uh, maybe the second uh, phase were more unstable. It was more towards the summer. Uh, and uh, also in the first phase, the winds were a little bit higher than, than in, the f in the first phase. Um, OK, so we have here, I just showed you the Mone Obikov stability parameter, but we actually used the richest number. Uh, it's a matter of taste almost, but uh, we think that these kind of larger structures are, are very dependent on the richest number. Uh, then we divided the data in, in stability classes, uh, unstable, neutral, and uh, stably stratified, uh, where the um, thresholds were minus 0.1 for the richest number and a hundredth plus a hundredth. And then we had 75% of the cases in, in neutral. So then a little bit about the, the data analysis. So this is one scan from one LIDAR. And uh, if you take all the data, you can see a lot of noise and unreasonable values. But if you traditionally, you, you, pl you plot these, um, or you, you take a, a threshold for the uh, this, this uh, carrier to noise ratio and say everything above that is, is real data. Uh, but if you do that, then you cut away a lot of, of, of uh, valid data. You could say some of these data down here are probably valid, uh, even though they're low, below the threshold. Then you can also, if you plot the line of side velocity versus uh, carrier to noise ratio, you can cut away here and say, OK, this is probably noise. This is probably noise. If you do that, then you get this field. It has a lot of more data than, than the one where you just uh, uh, do the carrier to noise ratio. Uh, uh, but it also has some noisy data. So some of the data down here are not valid. So in, instead of doing this, then that was mainly Leonardo, try to plot all the measurement points as a function of CNR the range gate, the distance from the instrument, and the line of size velocity. And here you see some clear clusters of what should be real data, and you see some noise. And these points here, they are actually hitting hard targets. So there are some turbines uh, far out in the field that 
at, at, at 50 meters we will cut into to them. And then he did some cluster analysis and could back out all the valid data. And that's published in atmospheric measurement techniques uh, some years ago. Uh, so by doing that, we, uh, we, we got some uh, pretty good data. Okay, so now I go to like two examples of, of data and, and we'll analyze them in quite some detail. It's a neutral case and a stably stratified case. Uh, the, no, it's a neutral and unstable, unstably stratified case because the stable cases, they have too little turbulence and too small a scale that it was uh, really possible to measure very much. The, the spatial filtering was too hard when we have stably stratified conditions. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, unstable during the day and, and the neutral, they were typically a transition between day and night. Um, and just a little bit about the, the terms in, in the kinetic energy budget, where these are the terms that we could actually measure from the meteorological mass, the buoyancy production, the shear production, and the divergence of the uh, flux of uh, turbulent kinetic energy and the energy dissipation. We can measure all those. We couldn't measure the, the pressure uh, transport term, so that must be, uh, uh, yeah, that was uh, not, so it's not balanced. But let's just have a look at, at the data. So this is uh, the neutral case where we see we have uh, shear production as a function of height. Uh, it's not quite balanced by the energy dissipation, uh, so there's quite some imbalance. It could be uh, pressure transport, but it could also be inhomogeneous uh, uh, terrain. Uh, in the unstable cases, we have shear production near the ground, the first 50 meters, but then that disappears, and we have uh, buoyancy production almost balancing the, the energy dissipation. And at, at the stable phase, I mean, we cannot really see the surface from at least from 200 meters. Uh, okay, so here are some plots of what we then actually measure. So you can see the, this is 50 meters above ground level, this is 200 meters above ground level. They're not measured at the same time because we had to move the entire experiment up. Um, so they, this is measured in May, this is measured in, in uh, August. And uh, what you see here is uh, uh, the longitudinal wind speed. So the, the wind speed in, in the longitudinal direction uh, over the roughly 50 square kilometer um, area. And uh, the mean wind speed is roughly the same, around eight meters per second. And then you have the fluctuations colored here. And here you have the Richardson number, which is on the negative side all the time. Um, maybe you can start this. So, so this is what it looks. So one frame per, per 90 seconds. And you see this kind of longitudinal structures, thinner structures of, uh, of uh, low wind speed and broader structures of, of uh, high wind speeds. Um, and then you see the stability go here. So this is unstable conditions. Um, then let's look at um, neutral conditions. So again, it's, it's a little bit stronger wind speed, around 12 meters per second. And you see uh, thinner streaks here at, at 50 meters. At 200 meters, the scale seems to be quite a lot larger uh, than at, at 50 meters contrary to the unstable case where they were not so, so different. Good, then, then we can uh, kind of take this area and then as we advance 90 seconds, we can add what came into the area and do that quite a long number of times and then we get like a big area using Taylor's hypothesis, you could say, uh, to, to plot the flow field. So this is 20 kilometers long and six kilometers, five, six kilometers wide. And this is neutral conditions at 50 meters. 
And this is the longitudinal component where you can clearly see the low uh, wind speed streaks and uh, some higher wind speed areas here. And, and it's all stretched in the longitudinal direction. Uh, if you look at, um, at the transverse component, it's more kind of chaotic, less uh, structure uh, than the longitudinal component. Uh, but if we look at the, okay, so this is at, at 200, the same at 200 meters here. I mean, structures are, are much larger. You don't have these thin streaks. And there also start to be some kind of a structure in, in the transverse component, even though it's, you can see the anisotropy is very different here. You see some streaks here, it's more kind of random. Um, okay, then at this, now we use exactly the same uh, scale for all the plots. So this was at 50 meters, fluctuations are stronger. Uh, at 200 meters, the fluctuations are weaker. If you then go to uh, unstable conditions and have the same scale for the normalized uh, fluctuations, then we see um, very powerful uh, kind of coherent structures, you could say, uh, uh, going in the, in the wind direction. And you also see them very clearly in the transverse direction. And you can see here there's like a convergence zone where uh, below here or you have uh, positive winds and uh, above you have negative winds. So there's a convergence in the transverse direction. And that kind of coincides with this structure here, which is uh, uh, low speed. So, so that, that makes sense that you have convergence and you have lift up air and, and that has lower speed than, than the surrounding. And the, the fill factor, you would say, of the, these areas is smaller than the positive uh, areas. And, that is also in, in accordance with the general knowledge, I think. So, yeah. yeah? Uh, how, uh, do you have an estimate of ZI? How, how deep is the boundary uh, Yes, we have. Uh, I'll come back to that. We didn't measure it directly, but uh, we, we used the uh, Wolf simulation to kind of back it out. Um, OK, so now we go up to 200 meters for the unstable. Uh, situation, it, it doesn't change that much. You still have these convergence zone. Maybe the velocities are not that strong as previously, but you still see some correlation between low speed streaks and, and convergence. You can see that here. All right. So, okay, then if we come try to combine this, uh, then we can um, look at uh, now we plot the divergence, the horizontal divergence, which we, we can measure. <clears throat> we have to filter a lot, not to get it too noisy. So we filter almost at the integral scale. <clears throat> but uh, what is plotted here in color is the divergence of the, the or the horizontal divergence. Then we have hatched <clears throat> the areas of um, negative U1, so negative fluctuations uh, for the unstable uh, situation, and you see yeah, that that uh, uh, the the divergence and and these negative areas they they correlate quite well. So um, so here, I mean, there's a R here, which is 0.47, that says how well are these things correlated, and and they are correlated quite well. If you go up to 200 meters, they are less correlated, and if you go to I haven't brought those plots, but if you go to the noodle case, they are much less correlated. You have 0.1 close to the surface at 50 meters and, and 0.04 uh, uh, for, for, for the 200 meter case. So of course, when it's unstable, then you can feel the surface and then divergence uh, um, is correlated with the vertical velocity because you can feel the surface, and then the vertical velocity brings up lower speed air. So that, that makes uh, sense. So um, for, for the unstable conditions, there are very similar structures in, in this, what it calls the surface layer that's 50 meters, and, and the mixed layers like 200 meters. Uh, and the f amplitude of the fluctuation is pretty much the same in contrast to, to the neutral. Uh, 
neutral uh, uh, situations. And the convergent flow is correlated with the negative uh, uh, wind speed fluctuations. OK, then we go to, to analyzing more cases and, and doing some statistics. Um, and we look at the anisotropy in, in the horizontal plane through the statistics. And we look at uh, the, the spectrum, so some kind of, of two-dimensional spectrum that we can um, look at. OK, so first, I mean, look at correlation functions. So this is a, this is a busy plot. But on the x-axis, you ha have either uh, x normalized by zi, which we get from uh, a mesoscale uh, or from WARF simulations estimated, or y divided or eta divided by c, so either the transverse direction or the longitudinal direction. And what we see under neutral conditions um, is, uh, for example, if we, the solid curves are 50, the dashed are 200 meters. So if you look at the black curve, that's the correlation in the x direction. Then we see uh, 50 meters here and 200 meters here. So the length scale changes a lot as you go up. And the length scale in the transverse direction of uh, the longitudinal fluctuations is much uh, smaller than uh, in the longitudinal direction. And it changes also very much with, with height. So the solid curve spreads out and, and come to the dash curve at 200 meters. If you look at the transverse component of velocity and, and look in, in the same direction, uh, you see the length scales are much, much, much smaller than, than over here. The correlation goes much quicker down. And there's still some difference between uh, 200 and 50 meters. 200 meters has a wider correlation. The vertical line size is an attempt to see, OK, where are there some features or peaks in the correlation. Um, if you look at the unstable, then it's very different because there's not much difference between the correlation at 50 and 200 meters, uh, uh, either in the longitudinal or the transverse direction. Um, and that's the same is almost true for, for the transverse direction. Maybe there's a, some difference in the, in the longitudinal direction, not so much difference in the transverse direction. All right, so that's kind of empirically what, what we see. Uh, and uh, then we can try to plot a spectrum of, of, of this two-dimensional uh, field. And the spectrum is, of course, a, a two-dimensional quantity, saying what Fourier modes are most Im important. So this is now the neutral case. We s and, and the scale here is logarithmic, and we use the same scale all the time for the, the normalized spectrum. We pre-multiply the spectrum with the length of the horizontal wave uh, vector in order to, to make uh, equal kind of areas in this plot contributing equally to the variance. So what we see here is that uh, the, the, the two direction, the y direction dominates. So you have some structures here. And that corresponds to um, longitudinal streaks. They will, they will give power in. in in um, k2 direction, and k1 is equal to 0. <clears throat> then you have some, some circles here. That's, this has something to do with the, the measurement height. So we cannot really measure anything uh, smaller than measurement height. Uh, these circles here is half, two, and four times uh, the wavelength that corresponds to the, um, the inversion height. So you can see energy is from maybe a half up to four, five, six times the, the uh, inversion height. That's, that's for the one component, so the longitudinal component. The, 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 as we also saw on, on the, the field plots, the transverse direction is much more fuzzy. You have a little bit dominance uh, in the top and the bottom, uh, meaning that you have some uh, stretching in, in, in the longitudinal direction, but it's really spread out uh, a lot. And not much of, in terms of large, larger structures, the structures are like one CI or maybe even smaller in, in, in wavelength. <clears throat> OK, 
Okay, so that was neutral. If you then go uh, to unstably stratified and, no, now we go to, yeah, unstably stratified at still at 50 meters, we see uh, uh, kind of not so different pictures in, in U. We see maybe some stronger uh, power in, in longer, in larger scales. But in, in the two directions, we see a lot of power in, 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 in this direction. Uh, contrary to the to the um, um, neutral conditions, neutral at 200 meters, still some structure, but it's larger than before. The the most the most powerful parts of the spectrum have moved, moved closer to zero, where we have the larger scales. Uh, the, the second component, the transverse component, is still very fuzzy. Uh, and here we have unstably stratified spectra, not so different from. 50 meters, but now at 200 meters, we see, see a lot of structure in, 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 in the uh, two direction. Good, then if we take, uh, now we look at, at length scales in, in the two directions, uh, uh, determined from the uh, correlation function. So one length scale is the length scale of the long wind component in the long wind direction, normalized by CI, obtained from a, a wharf simulation. And then we have the transverse component in the tr transverse direction. And if, if turbulence was isotropic in, in, the, in the horizontal directions, then uh, they should be on the one-to-one -one line. But um, uh, you can see the, the length scale in, in, in this direction is, is, is longer, uh, corresponding to stretching in that direction not so much in still a domination of, of this length scale at 200 meters, but not as strong as at, at 50 meters. Um, if we look at the neutral case, then close to the surface, the, this length scale is much, much larger than, than that length scale. But at 200 meters, they are, they are more equal. There's quite some difference there. Um, then we can look at a, a different length scale. So this is the length scale of the longitudinal component in the transverse direction. And this is the uh, length scale of the transverse velocity component in the longitudinal direction. And they should also be equal if turbulence were isotropic. And this is very important for the application. Remember, we, we wanted to uh, use the I mean, all this to look at the uh, meandering of uh, wind turbine wakes. And wind turbine wake direction is determined by U2, and then X1 is how fast in time uh, is that changing. So that will tell us something about the meandering. So this is quite an important length scale for, for the investigations in wind energy. And you can see here for the unstable case, they are, ah, they cluster. They're not so different, maybe at 200 meters list length scale in the longitudinal direction uh, is, is larger. Um, for, for neutral, it's a little bit different. You have, yeah, different length scales here. Um, and, and you see the distribution here. And the, the colors are uh, the, the CI. So, um, yeah, you can see for I mean, it's a little bit complicated that, that you color with the CI, but you also normalize with the CI here. So that's uh, a little complicated. Good, so, um, so, so the, in conclusion, the, the length scales uh, are very different from uh, 50 meters up to 200 meters for neutral conditions. Contrary to unstable stratifiers, they are, they're more equal. That, that uh, corresponds well with what we know. Um, we see these elongated structures all the time, uh, especially in, in U1. <clears throat> and uh, unstable stratification, the U2 fluctuations are as energetic as the U1 fluctuations. And uh, of course that imply, has some implications of, of, for wake meandering. Uh, in the neutral case, th those are the strongest, the, the longitudinal fluctuations are the strongest. Um, and you see some non unstable, you see dominant length scales of maybe 
one half or one to maybe four uh, heights of the times the height of the, the, the boundary layer or, or the inversion. Um, so we can use these uh, long-range pulsed lighters uh, for, for uh, characterizing the, uh, the structure of, of uh, large-scale motions of the atmosphere. Um, it's very different, uh, difficult for, for, for stably stratified flows because they are the setup filters out the, the small scales because the, the measurement volume is, is too large and the sweeping averaging is, is too large. Um, roughly speaking, you, we could identify streaks near the, so, so narrow, very long, uh, low velocity uh, areas or called streaks near the surface under neutral conditions. And then some maybe convex rolls over the whole boundary layer during unstable uh, conditions where we also had some shear. Um, in the two dimensional spectra, we could see the these structures as, as kind of broad peaks in, in uh, along the K2 axis uh, for that is K1 equals to zero. Uh, and of course that cannot be seen in, in a one dimensional spectrum. And then the, our task now is to integrate all this knowledge in, into the models that, that uh, wind turbine manufacturers and, and developers use to, to model wake meandering and and wake meandering has consequences for loads on downstream wind turbines and the energy production in general of, of a, a wind farm. So uh, with that, I'm open for questions. So thank you very much. So we have plenty of time for questions. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who are watching virtually, please use the Slido interface, which is located at the bottom of the presentation screen. And we have a question from the in-person audience. Uh, Jakob, really neat. Um, I, I was trying to reconcile. In the FlowViz, the structures look much, much longer than ZI. I mean, they're really long. I mean, if you go to the very first Ah, yeah, so for instance, there, they're really long. And whereas the uh, statistics says they're a lot shorter, uh, is it just a consequence of not following one or something else? Mm. Yeah, so, so you, you're wondering how can we have this picture when, say, this is unstable conditions at 200 meters and then if you go to the uh, unstable picture here, then, I mean, so here, this, this corresponds to a wavelength, I think, of four times CI. And then you have energy out here, but you also have, like, closer to the center. So maybe if we... Um, if we make a circle here, then it'll be HCI, and then you have some energy also at HCI. So, and and uh, that's also something with two pi and, and stuff that uh, that uh, that maybe disturb the picture. But it, but it looks like you have some energetic things really close to uh, zero, um, and yeah, and th th those energetic things they move away. Uh, maybe not much, but but if you go to um, neutral, or at least at um, sorry, neutral, you have much less energy here, but you have more out here, and and I think if we um, compare neutral at 200 meters, I mean, maybe not so coherent. In this direction, I mean, this this looks coherent, but there's a lot of variations. While at unstable condition at 200 meters, it's it's more more coherent, I think. But uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's like a Lagrangian structure that's moving through the field. Yeah. Whereas if you're looking at an Eulerian statistic, and there you don't always tell you the same thing. 
Yeah, I mean, this is a mix of, yeah, it's a mix because, I mean, you have a snapshot here and then you tile all the snapshots on top of each other. And if you look at uh, what actually determines the meandering of a, um, a wake, then it's also a mix of uh, Eulerian and Lagrangian statistics because you are in a fixed point and you look at the wind direction fluctuations there. But as you add wake downstream, the wind direction may change, but it, it happens very slowly. Uh, so usually in, in the mo all the models, you assume that the wake deficit that is born with some wind direction that or created at some wind direction just keeps that direction forever. That's that's uh, yeah. the, how it's modeled. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. We have a question on Slido from Sue Ellen Hopp, and she asks, what are your expectations for variations in the vertical under stable conditions and implications for wind energy? Um, yeah, I mean, as, as some of the slides showed, then uh, there's, there's not, m I mean, we didn't see m m strong fluctuations in, in, uh, uh, under stable conditions, uh, and, uh, and we couldn't really measure them with the, with the uh, course resolution of our setup. Uh, so I think in the vertical, under stable conditions, maybe weir is, is more important. So how, how the wind direction changes with height, that affects development of the, the wake and, and, and so on. So I don't think we can say so much about stable conditions from this experiment, but, uh, but it's well known that stability means a lot for development of wakes. I mean, of course, if it's unstable, then the wake dissipates much more quickly than under stable conditions. We can also see on offshore wind farms that under stable conditions, the wake from the entire wind farm can last for 50, 100 kilometers while it dissipates in maybe 10 kilometers for unstably stratified uh, flow. So, yeah, thank you for that question. Okay. We have more questions. Maybe question. I missed it. Uh, could you Mr. Could you um, say more about large and small scale? What's that actually when you say that large and small scale in terms of dimensions? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, small scales. That's that's rotor diameter or smaller. So, things that are important for dynamic loads on the wind turbine rotor. So, less than two hundred meters here, and then large scale for me is scales that can affect the entire. Uh, wake uh, to the side, so it's, it's uh, larger than 200 meters. Uh, and, and I think the resolution, the practical resolution of our ex experiment is maybe 200 meters, so that's, that's what we're looking at here. Because yeah. the LiDAR resolution is much smaller. The measurement is much smaller. Right? Yeah, the, the, the resolution, the full width half maximum of the weighting function of the LiDAR is 35 meters. But it's, it sweeps, that's one thing, it sweeps. So, so out of five kilometers, maybe uh, that sweeping length over uh, one second is uh, maybe several hundred meters, two, three hundred meters. And the other thing is that at any specific point in the measurement domain, the lighters are not measuring simultaneously. They only measure simultaneously on the symmetry mm -hmm. uh, axis of the, uh, oh, oh, yeah, on, on the symmetry axis here. So, so out here they, they measure at slightly different times and that also deteriorates the, the resolution. So, so it's not the lighter uh, pulse length or whatever is, is a, it's not a, determine the resolution, it's all the other things. So. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions from the audience? Um, there's, um, if you do conditional sampling, could you infer what the actual structure was, like Ron Adrian, et cetera, 
Uh, have you tried any of that? Yeah, I mean, we, we have tried uh, yeah, dynamic mode decomposition and, and all that. And uh, Leonardo is, is working on a, a paper about that, but um, um, I don't know how much more it tells you than, than the classical structure functions and so on. But, uh, let's, I mean, he's, he's working on it and yeah. it's... Uh, it's uh, linear stochastic estimations were really, I found them very cool. Yeah. Yes, I mean, he has decomposed the fields in, in a number of dynamic uh, modes. So, so you have some time information as well and try to reconstruct it. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, so. It takes time to do that. But yeah, that's yeah. Mm -hmm. awesome. Well, if no one has any further questions, um, if you're interested in Dr. Mann's research or you have any questions, you can reach out to him by his email, which is on the flyer. But also, Jakob, you will be here until July the 24th, so there's plenty of time to collaborate and meet with him in person. Dr. Mann, I'd like to thank you for a really interesting presentation on exploring wind energy using Doppler LIDARs. Please, let's thank our speaker. Thank you very much.